Welcome to our third workshop, and this time we will be talking about multi-level analysis. This is the session one in, in which we'll be introducing you to multi-level analysis. And we'll have the session two in which we'll actually get our hands in the data and run multi-level models. This should be really fun, and you'll see that it's not that complicated. Once you get the concept of multi-level analysis, then um, you can play around with your data set, run different models, and keep in mind that you can have mediation models with multi-level analysis, you can have conditional indirect fact models uh, with multi-level analysis. For simplicity and the purpose of this workshop, we are keeping it uh, to the direct effect. So we are looking at the direct effect of our independent variable to our dependent variable at multi-level of uh, the observations. Okay? So we can have different levels, and that this will become more clear to you as we move through uh, our sessions. Um, so this is the agenda for today. We'll start off with this question. What are multi-level models? And then we uh, address this second question. Why is multi-level analysis important for management scholars? And then we'll start talking about some more technical things like RWGs, ICC-1, ICC-2, and then we will also dive into the equations. And some people are more visual, they like graphs, other people like numbers. So in this particular session in which we are introducing, uh, introducing multi-level analysis, um, we will be doing both. Uh, the visual and also the equations. And another terminology that you may hear about to refer to multi-level analysis is HLM, hierarchical linear modeling. Uh, usually uh, they are used um, to mean the same thing. Um, in general, my understanding is that HLM is a tool that you can apply to run multi-level analysis models. So let's start talking about multi-level analysis. Let's start understanding what is this thing. So usually when we refer to multi-level analysis, we are uh, implying that there are the parameters can vary at different levels. Just to give you an example, okay, so uh, Schools would be our level two variables in the model, and the teachers level one. So the teachers are embedded in the school, and the students are embedded in classes. So there is this dependence in the higher level uh, that you are talking about. Remember, when we are running regressions, one of the assumptions is this independence of the observations. But now, because the students are embedded in the classes, that independence has been violated. If we bring, if we bring this concept to organizations, uh, we have departments embedded in firms, we have employees embedded into depart in departments, and we have days embedded in employees. So for example, uh, you may have one leader uh, managing four, five, ten followers. So those followers are embedded in that particular leader. They are not in the, the, the observations of the followers are not independent. So you needed to take that into consideration when running models. It could be that the leader is extremely extroverted and that has an effect on how these followers behave. It could be that the leader is more introverted and that could also have an impact on these other followers would behave. Um, another thing that's important is that we can actually run uh, models and to take into consideration daily observations. And those daily observations would be embedded in the individual. For example, you can measure mood. Okay? We can have positive mood on Monday, uh, negative mood on Tuesday. Uh, perhaps Friday you are more on a positive mood because the weekend is just over there. But all those observations are embedded in the individual and that individual has his or her own personal characteristics. In general, 
he is more a positive person. In general, he is a more negative person. So all those characteristics also influence the daily observation. So it's important to take into consideration uh, this nesting, this embeddedness of the observations. And uh, we can have models that go from level 1 to level 2 to level 3 to level 4. So there is no problem at all with having multiple, multiple levels. The problem, if you will, becomes from a statistical standpoint because we have low power as we move up because our observations, the number of observations then uh, is uh, what we have at the highest level of the data set possible. And we can run models in which the independent variable is at level 2 and that influences our dependent variable at level 1. Uh, for example, what I mentioned, the leader influencing how followers behave. Uh, you can have independent variables at level 1, independent variables at level 2 influencing uh, the dependent variable. In this case, usually you have a level 2 variable that you can use as a control. So we are not interested in the effect of the leader on the employee performance, but we are interested in the job satisfaction of the employee influencing the performance. Uh, but because these employees are embedded in the leader, we needed to take that into consideration. And also, we can test for interactions at different levels of analysis. Um, in this case, let's say that the leader interacts with the follower job satisfaction to predict follower performance. Notice here that we don't have level 1 variable predicting level 2 variables. We don't have uh, follower satisfaction predicting leader behavior. And that the reason is because we don't have within individual variance to be explained if our dependent variable is at level 2. Okay? This is more technical. We can address that later in one of our sessions. So why is multi-level analysis important? The reason here is that um, we can theorize ab about cross-level effects. As I describe it, the effects of the department culture or the leader on employees' performance or the effects of leadership on creativity. We can also theorize about longitudinal effects. Do you remember the example I gave? Employees and we me are measuring mood on a daily basis. So that's a longitudinal design. We can model that as well. And statistically, what's important is that we are partialing out our clustering effects, our nesting effects. That fact that is unique to that particular group of people. And uh, if we don't do that, we may have uh, mistakenly small standard errors because uh, we are violating this assumption of independence of uh, the observations. Okay. I, I added here a few equations. Uh, so if you want to go through those equations by yourself, you can do that. This is just a piece of information for you to run some models or to use these variables or equations to, to get to this conclusion that, well, yes, we are getting small standard errors if we don't adopt multi-level analysis. There is this, I mean, in 1998, Chan put together this idea of different models for multi-level analysis. We have the additive model in which we just add uh, the observations of the employees, or let's say the followers of that particular lead, leader. So we add those observations, and then that's an additive, additive model. Uh, the direct consensus model, we needed to show that there is some agreement um, a, among those followers. So that's the direct consensus model. And then we have the reference shift consensus model. So think about the reference shift when we are changing from uh, the individual level to the team level. 
And that happens, uh, for example, um, with, um, let's say, uh, performance. Are you looking at the individual performance or are you looking at the team performance? You can report on my performance or you can report on the team performance. You are changing the reference. And you have also the dispersion model, and there is a lot of opportunities here with the dispersion model. With the dispersion model, we are looking at the variance in that particular group. Okay? It could be that the mean is important, but also the variance can provide you information about how individuals behave in that particular group. And the process model, in which we are theorizing here that the process at different levels of analysis are exactly the same. So now let's talk about RWGs, ICC-1 and ICC-2. Uh, we'll be talking about agreement and reliability. When uh, we are running multi-level models, uh, we needed to see if the people, uh, or the, yeah, the people in the team or in the group, they agree or they reliably report on the particular measures that we want. So with agreement, we are talking about RWGs, which is this within-group agreement. The standard for research is that this agreement should be higher than 0.7. Um, so an example of agreement is, let's say that we have three people in this group, and we all say one, or report one, two, and three. Uh, so yeah, high agreement. Okay, so we all agree that this is um, this construct should be one, two, and three. Reliability is a little bit different. We are talking about consistency of responses among graders. So in this same group, we could have one person saying one, two, and three, the other person saying two, three, and four, and the other person saying three, four, and five. The variance among their own responses is basically the same, so they are reliable. So we can have high agreement and low re reliability, and high reliability and low agreement. Just an example, uh, in a group of two, we could have a person with one, two, and three, and the other person with three, four, and five. They don't agree, but they are reliable. The dispersion is the same between these two people. Okay. Uh, and uh, another way to talk about reliability here is the proportion of variance explained by group membership. And we have two uh, ways to calculate uh, reliability, and we, in management, we tend to report both ICC-1 and ICC-2. ICC-1 is the reliability of a single assessment, and ICC-2 is the reliability of the group means. Uh, I added all the equations here in this slide, so you can think about these equations and uh, understand them by yourselves. What I also did was to put or to make available to you a file that calculates the RWG, ICC-1, and ICC-2, and this file is available in the descriptions of this video. If you want to get that file, just click in, uh, in that link that is in the description session. And now let's talk about the equations. So when you are um, running models, when you are thinking about multi-level analysis, you have a between unit model and a within unit model. With the between unit model, that looks pretty much like a regression equation. Okay? You have the dependent variable, you have the intercept, and you have the slope, and also a error term. What happens with the U within unit uh, model is that your intercept and your slope can also vary within that particular group. So here, your, inter your intercept has a mean plus some deviation. The same thing happens with your slope. There is a mean and some deviation. When you see the graphical representation of that, I think it will become a little bit more clear to you. So we could have models in which the teams vary in the intercept, but they have the same slope. 
you have teams in which the intercept is the same, but the slopes are different. And you also can have uh, teams that both vary the intercept and the slope. So now you have this everything put together and you have an equation, a mixed level equation, in which you have between and within information. One assumption that's critical is that your mu, your random error for the, uh, for the uh, lower level, for the within level, uh, needs to be independent, normally distributed, and with expected value of zero and variance uh, tau squared equal to the variance of mu. So in this session, we introduced you to multi-level analysis. We talked about what multi-level models are, why they are important, gave you some graphical representations of multi-level, and also talked about RWGs, ICC1, and ICC2. Thank you.